Thank you. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the last paper of this very, very interesting conference. I will try to be uh, last but not least, do my best. Okay, in this paper, I will look at the historical circumstances that led to the to the evolvement of so-called new traditional poetry or tradition-based poetry composed by traditional singers that propagated the superiority of the Soviet system, which was performed and published between the late 1930s and 1950s in Soviet Karelia, and how this form of traditional poetry responded to the interests of the Soviet propaganda. Soviet Karelia is situated right next to Finland. It was founded around the same time that Finland gained independence in 1920s. Between, it's situated between Finland and the White Sea. Here are some administrative names it had or labels of the history. Uh, historically, uh, this area had close ties both with Finland and with, with Russia, or with Finns and uh, Russians. This is also the area where oral poetry, especially epic poetry, was still being performed in the 19th century, when Elias Lönnrot wrote the Kalevala, uh, the national epos of Finns, on the basis of this poetry. The metric form of this oral poetry is commonly labeled Kalevala meter because of its best known from the Kalevala. The Kalevala became an emblem of Finnish independence movement in the uh, 19th century and hence it contributed heavily to Finnishness. What is to be a Finn? So uh, consequently the Kalevala was quite visible in the right-wing nationalist movement of the 1930s in Finland as well. In the Soviet ideology, the attitude towards tradition was quite contrary. In the process of introducing and establishing a completely new societal system, concepts such as new and progressive became slogans in Soviet public discourse, which meant conversely that concepts such as old and traditional were represented as backward and uh, reactionary. However, it was uh, evident that traditions in the many meanings that the concept may have still had a significant role in people's lives and thinking. In the struggle for people's identity, it was not clever to abandon all old and traditional when it could be manipulated to favor, favor the socialist ideology. So tradition could be tamed by the ideological regime in ways that are not different from how tradition has been and is still being conceived in modernity as discussed, for instance, by William Wilson and uh, especially Perti Antonen in uh, tradition through modernity. Laura Olson argues that in uh, USSR, folklorists have to struggle to find a niche, uh, as has been also discussed in uh, several papers yesterday and today. The highlighting of local and na national traditions did not serve the interests of the ideological regime. Maxim Gorky in uh, 1934, in his speech at the first Congress of Soviet Authors Union, elevated folklore as the ultimate model for valued literature that sprang from the working class masses. This soon instigated ideas of evaluating folklore on the scale 
acceptable or unacceptable that is comparable with the current evaluations of literature and uh, other arts as well. And for instance, uh, concerning Soviet Karelia, Uryo Savolainen in an article about folklore in Ingria in uh, 1934, propagated that uh, development of folklore that supports our construction work and the new Soviet culture must be advanced by all possible means. In Soviet Karelia, Finnish language was abolished the, uh, as the official language besides Russian in 1937 as a part of the campaign against nationalism. And uh, this is when the Finnish literature was abolished as well. This created a need for, for uh, genuine Karelian literature. And it was suggested at this time that the Karelian oral tradition could serve as basis for this. It was also suggested in 1938 that ideological orthodox folklore could be produced in Karelia in the same way that had been done in Dagestan and Kazakhstan earlier. So the work on folklore was at this time largely in the hands of the Karelian Authors Union in Soviet Karelia. And in 1939, the task to educate tra traditional singers and to publish their works was given to the Karelian Authors Union. In other words, folklore was subordinated to the same principles of censorship as literature or press. This, this resulted in the kind of poetry that can be labeled uh, new Kalevala meter poetry. It was composed by traditional singers who were well versed in traditional oral poetry, who had grown into it. It was published since 1938 and especially after 1941 when the Karelo Finnish Soviet Socialist Republic was established. And by this time, uh, Finnish was the official language in Soviet Karelia again. It was, uh, this poetry was detached from traditional performance arenas. Uh, and so they were uh, the texts in them were separated and uh, the texts were recontextualized in this process. One can find variation in form by individual singers and also uh, aerially, whereas the most praised poets are from northern parts, the three most famous from just one village, Uhtua. The most central markers of traditional poetry are still present in these uh, poems, like the syllabic, uh, syllabic line structure, alliteration and parallelism. Like in traditional poetry, uh, established traditional lines and line clusters are also used either in connective sections or in a slightly altered form in meanings that differ from traditional uses. Obviously, the poems reflect an ideology that is alien to the tradition and also applies new vocabulary, therefore. And this also seems largely deliberate choice as well. However, it's obvious that this is not always easy. One can notice difficulties in maintaining traditional meter and poetic preferences in their use. And it seems that the farther the concepts depart from uh, traditional expression, the less the expression complies to traditional form. Whereas exceptions also exist. For example, the word for five-year plan, uh, suunitelma, makes a beautiful line in traditional form. Uh, actually, I don't recall any other instances in Kalevala meter poetry traditional or no, not traditional, where only one word comprises a whole line. The contents of these poems uh, vary a lot. 
It is possible to say uh, in general terms that the poems depict and praise the current circumstances in Soviet Karelia. This is done especially by comparing the current economical and social situation with the situation in the uh, Tsar regime prior to the revolution. These poems have a number of messages to deliver. Uh, for instance, gratitude towards the regime and its leaders, uh, especially to Stalin prior to 1953, obviously. Um, praise of the regime and its leaders, especially Stalin. Uh, they also encourage people to keep on working for the USSR and so on. The contents of this poetry highlights or foregrounds the local advances of Soviet system such as Soviet technology, effectiveness of the kolkhozas, the choice of collective work and so on. And this is done mostly from the point of view of the singer who, however, often presents herself as a representative of the Karelian community. So as a conclusion to my brief paper, uh, these aspects seem relevant concerning Kalevala meter poetry as a medium of transmission from the point of view of the ideological regime in the Soviet Karelia. First, traditional poetry was a distinctive expression of Karelian identity. It also created a connection between the ancient past and the present through its traditional contents and form. And it had value as an internationally acknowledged tradition, especially through its connection to the Kalevala. In Soviet publications, these aspects were refigured in order to suit the Soviet ideological political strategy, both in interpretations of Kalevala and traditional poetry that it uh, consisted of, and in the new Kalevala media poems as well. Karelian identity was replaced in them by a proletarian identity. For example, Kalevala was described as an epos based on poems performed by working class people. And the poems were also designated Karelians as uh, loyal socialists. Concerning the uh, chronos of this poetry, the present, however miserable it may have been in the uh, 40s and 50s in the small villages of uh, Vienna Karelia, it was described prosperous with all the gifts of modernization. The mythic past about which the traditional epic poetry narrates was explained in terms of historical materialism as prophecies about the prosperous future in socialism. And especially as uh, poetry from some kind of a proto-communist society, which of course normalized socialism by being expressed in a traditional form. The ownership of Kalevala through the traditional poetry that it contained was claimed to belong to Karelians and not Finns. And the fact that the new Kalevala media poetry was being composed in the first place served as an additional proof of a moral right to Kalevala it is unsure how important the tradition, uh, tra the tradition of the manufacturing of new poems in a traditional form would have been if it was not a way to create confusion by the uh, ideological regime concerning the cultural relations between Finland and Soviet Karelia. And in the final slide, 
you can see how Stalin himself authorizes the celebration of the Kalevala's 100th anniversary in 1949. In this excerpt, situated right above Stalin's head, the Kalevala is labeled people's epos and furthermore Karela Finnish people's epos which was probably supposed to be quite scary to the Finns. And I let Stalin also have the final word in the paper and uh, in the final paper of this conference. Thank you. <laughs>